Hello, welcome to Memo Conversations. Our topic, my name is Osman Butt, I'm, your, I'm a video producer with Middle East Monitor. Our topic today is, how does language and photography bring us together? My guest today to answer this question is Fadi Boukaram. Uh, Fadi is a former professional photographer turned hobbyist in photography and linguist who grew up in Lebanon and earned a degree in engineering and business. However, by his 30s, Fadi decided he needed a career change and went into the world of photography. In 2013, he was part of a collective of photographers who set up the Observers Collective, a group dedicated to capturing the diversity of humanity around them. Fadi has travelled to a number of different places and, photog and photographed many different things from Beirut's, Beirut's skyline to an American subway. Uh, and many other things in between. Fadi is also known for his Instagram channel called uh, Cedarux, 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 um, where he dissects and explains language, words, and linguistics. Uh, Fadi, welcome to Memo Conversations. Thank you, Osman. Thank you for having me. And uh, forgive any mispronunciations. No worries. Um, <laughs> I, I should always start with that. Um, so as I sort of uh, alluded to in the introduction, you obviously uh, became a photographer, but you have now since taken it up more as a hobby net rather than a profession. Um, but I sort of want to go back before that um, and sort of discuss, you know, how did you even get into things like photography, traveling and obviously linguistics? So I want to start to start with because I feel like you started as a photographer um yeah. that sort of led on to the other thing so let's start there how did you sort of become a photographer and why uh that's well that that's an interesting question thank you for that uh the the truth is i know i'm from lebanon so 90 percent of the time the answer would relate to the war right because i grew up during the civil war and why did that want me to become a photographer is that when I was growing up, um, a lot of the people, as far as like family and friends and stuff like that, were not in Lebanon. They either had, you know, uh, left the country, fled the country. Some of them had passed away and all that. And in all of that, there were very little pictures to remember who these people are, even because we had spent a lot of time, you know, in the bomb shelter back then there were very little opportunities to photograph. So right now at my parents' place, there are maybe like a few albums of during our childhood. There, There's no not a lot of memories captured on film back at the time. So my initial, you know, foray into photography was mainly to document uh, family moments in the fear or hope that these could be kept for the future so as not to repeat what had happened, you know, in, in the past. So it had always started as a way of documenting specific moments, you know. And from that and from there, I found myself like I, I love how ca capturing images, you know, be it for documenting them, but also it's kind of it found a way of being a bit of a self-therapy from after the war because it's kind of like you're you're hiding behind the camera if you will you know when you're photographing and this proved to be very therapeutic to me and I just continued with it and now it's been what more than a bit over 20 years that I've been photographing but all all during that time I had a different uh career so I started in software engineering then I had to go to the US and come back to Lebanon you know, career in finance and now in taxes and all that. And I was, I, I quit my uh, corporate job in 2016 or 2015, something like that. That's when I decided I want to do documentary photography for a living. And I did that for three years, but then I thought it's like, I prefer, uh, you know, steady paychecks, <laughs> that steady income kind of thing. So I went back to it, to my career. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting transition because, of course, you did, uh, I mean, I mentioned you did engineering and business, which is probably the two most Lebanese things you could do. Right. <laughs> but then you left it to do photography. So you went to pursue a kind of art, but it's still something that is a big part of your life because uh, you still do it as a hobby, right? Yes, yes. 
And well, what? Mm, no. Uh, no, I was just going to say, like you mentioned, it's kind of like the most Lebanese thing. And it's something about like in the Middle East, it's kind of like uh, in most families, 99.9, I'd say. You can't out of school say, I want to become a photographer. The parents and the family is like, well, as a hobby, great. But as a career, you know, you have to go to law school, to engineering school, to medical school, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, I think an interesting question is because it used to be you went into three professions, medicine, law, or engineering, mm -hmm. at some point, business became an acceptable thing to do. And so it'd be interesting to sort of ex sort of trace back, when did business become an acceptable thing to study? And how did it gain such acceptance so quickly? <laughs> oh, I, 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 I honestly don't have an answer. But indeed, it's a very interesting question. I guess uh, the, the idea of being uh, your own boss, that's big in our country and I'm sure in a lot of countries. So it's kind of like if you go into business and to become your own boss and being, you know, answering to no one, that kind of mentality, that kind of thing, I guess that was the driver behind it. Maybe one of the reasons. Maybe, maybe, but I think maybe also there's a thread here to photography because in your photography, you're sort of doing this for yourself. And mm -hmm. so in a way, you're your own boss, but you're also, you know, you're doing more than that. You're capturing things. You're trying yes. to explore things and explore your own feelings and emotions at the same time. <laughs> but you're doing it as you're traveling. So what did, let's, let me put it like this. So you go to the United States, which was quite important. You also go to a place called Lebanon in the United States, which we'll come back to in a second. Yeah. How do you feel like your understanding of America and encountering American culture as somebody who grew up in the Arab world, how do you feel it changed through looking at it through the prism of a lens rather than just going and staying as a tourist or whatever? Oh, that, like, I, I can't underscore how much it changed me. And in, in here, I, I want to say, how to say so i lived in the u.s because that's where i did my graduate school and i was in the san francisco bay area, bay area so i lived there for a few years but then i went back but as part of the uh photographing photo uh photographic journey as in traveling all over the united states with a camera uh how did that change me because it allowed me to strike up conversations with people because there was a purpose to it i'm not photographing just as an outsider, it was an excuse to have conversations with people to listen to their stories. And it was absolutely surprising. Uh, I mean, maybe it shouldn't be, it shouldn't have been surprising in that when you listen to people's stories, if you remove all these labels of, you know, nationality, language, religion, whatever labels that are unfortunate necessities in our world, you see that there's a lot of similarities as to, you know, the conditions where people have grown up, whether it be it like, you know, the uh, financial difficulties of them growing up, how they live away from the city, what it means to be a farmer, especially if you come from, you know, like from a rural community or a farming community. So that had allowed me to understand how closer we are. And it sounds a little bit cheesy, maybe. And it sounds that maybe I shouldn't have known this since I should have known this since the beginning, but it didn't. It was only through the camera and through talking with people that was like, well, there is a way of bringing people closer together if we want to and try real hard. So that that was the lesson for myself. And to do it because uh, I'm sort of curious about this, um, yeah. because. And my thinking is obviously when you go from, as you mentioned, you went to the US to sort of study initially, um, but you're obviously moving from Lebanon, which is a different environment altogether. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously this idea that when you travel to a new place, there's a cultural challenge from being in the new place. I'm sort of wondering how true that is when you were in California studying and how this was transformed from traveling across and doing this photography stuff, uh, your relationship to this. Um, that, yeah, that, that, that's a great question to see. The thing is when I moved to the U S I didn't move to be alone as in, I wasn't there alone. I had my aunt and my cousins, I was staying with her. So the culture shocks were, uh, let's say lessened or diminished by the fact that I was with family, but now coming, uh, how to say 
trying to remember what are these cultural shocks. It's uh, it, it's like it's it's not that easy. But now I can remember just a few. In that, I would say, cultural shocks are really interesting. In that, not only do you see that the difference that other cultures have with ourselves, but it also makes you ask questions about your own culture as to why do we do things. For example. Uh, one one of the interesting things is that, you know, in the Arab world, in a lot of other countries too, it's kind of like in Asian countries, even here in Ireland, let's say you go out with friends to a restaurant, right? Uh, there is this idea where people at the end will start fighting as to who's going to pay the bill and someone will try to sneak and pay it without people noticing, that kind of thing. Uh, that thing doesn't doesn't exist over there. And I learned it the hard way because the first couple of times, like when I'm going up with my new friends in college, it's kind of like, okay, I'll take care of the bill. And they would say, oh, thank you. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, that's it. Thank you. No one's going to argue with me. And wh why am I saying that? Because it makes me understand that there's a bit of theatricality to the way we do things. It's kind of like you say that you want to take, take care of it. But most of the time, like, we don't mean it. It's just like out of being polite and to come to an agreement in the end. And the same thing goes to, like, when someone offers you food, you know, and at a home. Back home, the way we were taught, it's kind of like, and I remember still my mother, it's kind of like lecturing us before we go to family or friends. It's kind of like, if they offer you food, you will say no. Under no circumstance, you will say yes. They have to insist. On the third time, you say yes, thank you. And if you're drinking something, you leave a little bit in the glass just to show that you're not that, eat, like those kind of things. There are societal things that we have over there that don't exist. It's kind of like, huh, so we do things differently. So it's these sort of things that it's kind of like make you understand about these little things, little differences that make us interesting. But in, initially they are a bit of a shock, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's always uh, interesting to think about those kinds of differences because um, I feel like uh, also, I don't know whether this is applicable in your case, but I would imagine if you're going around the US on your when you're doing your photography and you're talking to people of different backgrounds, you know, and you're taking all these pictures, I'm wondering, though, whether that impacts how you think about Lebanon itself, because obviously when you're in Lebanon, you come from a certain class or certain background, and perhaps you think you don't think about maybe people from other parts of the country or you don't think very highly of them. Maybe. I'm not saying you don't, don't think highly of them, but yes. it's common, for example, if you're from the city to look down upon people who are rural yeah. or whatever. I'm wondering whether this doing this journey and actually having to sit in the US and at the distance from Lebanon, it may be, I don't know, how did it impact the way you think about people who are from different backgrounds in Lebanon itself? Uh, I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's a great one. Uh, see that, that part, I was aware of it a little bit before leaving in that, yes, there's a, let's say a class system, but, um, so there's the city versus village, right? But at the same time, this is related, not just to, uh, the geographical thing of city versus uh, village, but it also about economic status. Also, it's about linguistic status, like in sociolinguistics in that in Lebanon, we have the city accent and we have the mountain accents, right? So of course there's North, South, et cetera, but there are difference. But in the city, the mountain accents are looked down upon, let's say in certain uh, professional fields. So in my field, because uh, my parents are from mountain villages and my father especially has that accent. So I kind of have a mixed accent sometimes. And in my job, I'd have to do presentations. And I remember once uh, it was at a bank because it was in finance. But one of the people who were, let's say, uh, organizing that thing, and she came to me and said, uh, you sound like a peasant who had an education abroad. Could you tone down your accent? She's talking about my speaking in Arabic. And to me, it's kind of like, oh my God, like how can people say stuff like that? But at the same time, you realize that this is, something that we have in Lebanon, but it's also a global thing, you know? Like, I, I can tell from your accent that you're in the UK, right? Yep. 
Yes. Uh, I mean, and of course, you know, that whole idea about how Southerners in the UK sometimes look down upon some of the Northern accents, right? Yeah. In the US, they have the same thing about the Southern accents. And you realize this is, I mean, this is one of the subjects that I wanted to do a video about soon, because there's a word for that in that came out in France. It's called glottophobia. I, I don't know if it's big enough to be called a phobia, but they call it glottophobia, which means that it's like when we look down upon people with different accents. So that kind of makes you realize it's kind of there's a bit of a common experience between people all around the world. If they live or if they speak within a certain accent, they will be looked down upon by city people, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it's great. I'm glad you actually brought back to language because this is where I was going towards. Yeah. I mean, because my feeling was um, from reading your bio is you started out in photography, but I feel like traveling across may have influenced how you thought about languages because that's the sort of thing you sort of get to when you travel to a lot of places. You speak to a lot of people, you do start to wonder mm -hmm. about words. So is that where your curiosity for language comes from? That, that's uh, one of the reasons where my curiosity for the language comes from. Um, another one was always this, uh, let's say, question about how did languages came to be? Like how, uh, imagining at some point that us humans spoke one language, you know? I mean, uh, in some of the holy books, whether it's biblically or in the Quran, there's the concept of, you know, uh, Babel, I guess. It's kind of like uh, an area where people spoke one language, but then they, you know, uh, they started speaking different languages. Well, I'm thinking from a, from an, like an anthropological point of view. It's kind of like us humans, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, did we speak a single language? And how is it that we split? And during that split, what words were retained or what features were retained and what became a difference? So there's this, just as kind of like, how did it look like when we were, when we spoke one tongue? And is there a way of just like exploring these a bit just to address that even though we talk differently in different languages, there might be a lot of common points worth sharing and discovering? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, I mean, today, for example, we especially in the anglosphere we don't tend to consider the importance of language in many ways when it comes to investigating things but in other cultures and other languages you know when you investigate the origins of language you're asking another question which is what is the origins of humanity itself i mean i think one of the more interesting examples of this was in say late 18th early 19th century france where you've probably familiar with francois chapollion the famous yep. translator of hieroglyphics into modern language, his initial obsession was the idea of finding the earliest people, and he thought through language he might be able to find it, which is not something an Anglo scientist would do today. <laughs> you know, it's a... well, uh, <laughs> how to say? I I would agree to a certain point with that, but what I what I mean is that English discovering how to say the roots of words in English, maybe they're not too common within the mass population, but as far as academically and scientifically, uh, there are, you know, heavy studies on looking the etymologies and the root of words, especially because English is such a hybrid language, meaning, uh, you know, it is a Germanic language, but most of its vocabulary, it's from Romance languages. So whether it's Old French or Latin, so trying to discover these. That being said, because my native language is Arabic, uh, it is much easier to find resources on the origins of words in the Indo-European languages. So whether we're talking Hindi or Farsi or French, English, etc., then it is for Semitic languages, especially Arabic. So it's not easy to find resources like etymology dictionaries on Arabic out there. And uh, what's, I wanna say sad, but maybe it's not too sad, but the major project being done on the etymology of Arabic words is actually not in the Arab world. It's in the University of Oslo in Norway. It's kind of like, why, why is it out? Why is it not us? You know, that kind of thing. 
but at least someone's doing it. So, yeah, somebody's doing it. I mean, it's uh, interesting because I was going to ask you. I mean, before we sort of got into the nitty gritty of Arabic, mm -hmm. uh, I was sort of wondering about also the place of languages because. Here, for example, in the UK, uh, a few years ago, when Conservative Party in power suggested that they sort of give more education to the language of Latin, which is obviously a classical language. What was interesting was the reaction to that kind of policy was, why are we wasting our time learning Latin when we could be doing more science and maths? There was this yeah. whole, like, what's the point of learning languages? It's a sort of, weird, I mean, this is obviously popular rather than academic level, but it is common cultural attitude here in the UK, uh, which I think speaks to a number of things, including the sort of privilege of the English language globally. So science, maths, all of that is effectively in English. So we have yeah. Anglo supremacy in that kind of way. But I'm sort of one, I don't get the impression in other societies. I've not heard people say, you know, why should we learn another language? What's the use of it? It might be specific languages, but in general, they seem to accept that if you want to be successful in Lebanon, you should know French or English or something along that line. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe we have a very specific situation in, in Lebanon because, like, yes, we have to how to say all our schools are mandatorily, I don't know if that's a word, trilingual, right? So I had to go to a French language school. Uh, the other option would have been an English language school. That doesn't mean that we don't learn Arabic. Of course, we learn it as a main language, but you have to learn another main language. And that is, it, I, I think, extremely helpful is that it equips you to, you know, interact with more people and, you know, and all that. And I don't know what's the academics uh, status right now on uh, teaching kids from when they were young, but I cannot imagine that it would be negative in any way. And that I read report after report that it's always helpful when you teach your kids multiple language as they are young, because that's when the age, that's the best age to kind of like learn language and give them this aptitude to want to learn language. And it's not just about language. This aptitude about you know, wanting to learn languages is about connecting with more people. Even if we want to put a business spin on it or success spin on it, it's kind of like the more languages you speak, it'll give you a better chance to succeed in life if that's what you want, you know? So, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure where I was going with it, but it's kind of like, I, I, I don't understand how not wanting to learn languages is something better than wanting to learn more languages. I mean, if you can't, you can't as an, as an adult, but I'm saying this is, this is learning a skill. This is just as important as learning, you know, math and sciences, learning new languages. Yeah. I was just reflecting on the difference in cultural attitude because it's not just Lebanon. I get the impression in a lot of other countries, there is a sense that, you know, you can't really become a doctor, for example, without knowing some English. I mean, there's medicine is most many countries is taught, in, not everywhere, but in many countries it's taught in English. So you can't even do, I think Syria is one of the few countries where it's all taught in Arabic, uh, which is an interesting thing. Um, yeah, yeah, but I wanted to sort of get to, because you've obviously started a channel. Well, yes. you've used your Instagram to yes. sort of spread the awareness about languages. So why did you decide to do this? Um, the, the answer is a bit unfortunate, but it is the pandemic. That's the answer. Uh, but let me explain. So there, uh, see, I, I live in Dublin, Ireland, and during the pandemic, we had a very, very rough lockdown period where you can't leave the house and it, you, it can only be outdoors for two kilometers, you know, stuff like that. So I was stuck at home a lot and I was working remotely at the time. And someone had mentioned I should download TikTok because it has funny videos on it. And that's the only reason I downloaded it initially, because it was a dark period for all of us. And I wanted to laugh. That's it. You know, then I maybe saw a couple of videos on languages like I've never spoken about on languages ever at that point. So we're talking late 2020. I had never spoken on that, but it's a subject that I was always interested in. So I was like, and this is just like one vi a one minute video or, you know, maximum two minute videos. 
So it doesn't require that much effort or focus for me. How about I do that? So I did a few videos and I saw that people were interested. I was like, okay, let me continue with this. And then my friends who are my age, i.e. older than the TikTok age, told me it's kind of like, could you please post it somewhere where we can actually see it? We're not going to download TikTok. So I started posting on Instagram and thankfully it's it's been good so far. So you seem to be doing very well actually i mean you've had i think uh you've got a, what seems to be a growing and large audience your videos do very well there seems to be a lot of interest in it um so could you perhaps tell us you know how your audience is reacting to your content and um what do you and what do you feel that you've you've learned about what people want to know about languages uh for the most part the absolute majority of the time, the reaction has been really great in that, why? Because I'm, how to say, a lot of my videos is taking expressions, let's say names of foods and stuff like that, that we don't usually examine in our day-to-day -day life, as in like, why is this fruit called such and such, you know, and trying to find what's it called in different languages and where the names come from. So for a lot of people, this is something that they would have taken for granted, maybe, or never asked a question about. It's kind of like, where does the word orange come from? And and it's like, oh, that's where it's... So it, people react positively to that, or I'm seeing that they have been reacting positively to that. It took me by surprise, but now it's kind of like, okay, so you know, people are interested in these things and I'm happy about that. There is a very minor subset of people who react not positively to these things, but this is the nature of being online and social media. But regardless where they come from, they're a specific type with people who, I don't want to say it's their character, but maybe the way they were brought up or how it is, is that, they tend to have a certain feeling that their language, their native language is better than the other languages. And if they discover that a word isn't, you know, native to their own, but it's a loan word, they react very badly to that. And I, I feel sad for them in a, in a way, but it's kind of like, I'm trying to find ways to address the point that there is no language that is better than another language. Like this should be, you know, axiomatic, let's say, you know, but people don't, not everybody thinks that way. And I'm hoping to address that in a nice way. Like I understand their point of views. It's a shock to think it's kind of like my language isn't as special as the other languages, but we have to admit it. Like all languages are the same. Yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating to think about. And I sort of wonder though, um, because of course, some language is obviously more similar than others yeah i mean a good example is you know the one thing that arabic phoenician greek latin all have in common is their alphabetical languages there's an alphabet mm -hmm. uh part of the issue is of course in china in mandarin it's not an alphabet language it's uh char it's made up of i think what three thousand characters characters something like that something yeah. like that and their way of ordering things is very interesting, you know, when you go through that language, because, you know, it's first of all, it's also a tonal language. So the way you say a word changes the meaning, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also the way they order things as well, because I remember in the 2008 Olympics, a lot of commentators were just shocked and surprised and couldn't understand how in Beijing, it was in 2008, the Olympics, and you had countries coming out in different orders and people just assumed there was no order to any of it. It's like Zambia's next to something else. And but from the Chinese point of view, it made perfect sense because it was based on yes. the Mandarin script. And there's a kind of numbering order they base it on. So yes. there was a method, but because it's not an alphabetical language, it was a True. huge issue for them. True. You know. So I'm just sort of uh, wondering, you know, how do you like? Is there like any sort of languages where it's hard to find commonalities between? Um, yes, ab absolutely. It's kind of like how, how to see it. the basics for commonalities between languages is the language families. So as I mentioned, the Indo-European earlier, so Indo-European is one branch. So 
it's easy or less hard to find commonalities between words and languages that are part of the Indo-European language, right? On the other hand, you have the Afro-Asiatic languages, part of which is the Semitic language branch. So that's Arabic, Hebrew, um, the Ethiopic languages like Amharic, uh, Aramaic, stuff like that. So you'll find there. Uh, if uh, trying to find commonalities as in words from one language to the next, they wouldn't be from common roots, but rather it would uh, be loan words. And that's an interesting point on its own. It's kind of like, why did this language borrow a word from this language? Which is often the case from Turkish words that happen in, that were borrowed into Arabic. I mean, obviously, obviously given the history of the Ottoman Empire, but again, over there, it's kind of like it teaches us more about, you know, history and society at the time. And ideas as well, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's very interesting. So I wanted to sort of ask here then, you know, you've interacted with different languages and cultures. How has this influenced the way you think about or changed the way you think about the Arabic language? Yeah. Uh... That's a sensitive question. <laughs> but I mean, I love Arabic, right? I absolutely love Arabic. Reflecting when, how to say, when interacting with people from different languages, I've mentioned it a few times that Arabic has this feature that rarely exists in other languages, which is the diglossia. That means that our written language is completely different as far as syntax, you know, vocabulary, morphology, all of that from the spoken languages. There is one unifying factor in the Arab world from a language perspective, which is fusha, the, the written language. Um, I wish, how to say, I wish kind of like reflecting on my own education and all that, that what we are learning in Arabic and about Arabic in school. Maybe that's a Lebanon thing, but I've spoken, like I've checked the curriculum in other countries as well, and it's the same, is that we learned some of the driest, least appealing Arabic texts when we are in school. And as an adult, now I look at these texts like, oh, these are beautiful, but these, is not, these are not made for 10 year olds and teenagers. Like we would need to approach education to the Arabic language a little bit differently trying to bring the modern world. Like when I was in school, I did not study anything that is more recent than the 18th century. You know, like that was not part of it. Like if the Arabic language is to thrive more, I think that we would need to bring more modernity to it so that for the future, we would be more inclined to create new Arabic worlds for the country we live in instead of just getting loanword after loanword after loanword from English or other languages, because we are getting behind on that. The written language does not change, right? But what we do import new words, but there is such a huge delay. Okay, let me simplify a little bit. Okay. We're talking on a computer, right? When I'm speaking Arabic, I say com computer, you know, computer. I just say the, the English loanword. The Arabic word does exist. It's hasub, right? But that word always comes in like, I don't know, five, ten years late, later than when it should be. That by that time, it's kind of like, okay, it's a word I will use if I ever write something formal. But when I'm speaking, I'm not I'm not going to say hasub. I'm not going to say fa'ra instead of like mouse, you know, that kind of thing. So in that sense, the... Uh, Arabic as a language being up to date with the world we live in from a technological perspective or a scientific perspective, I think it it needs a, there, something needs to change. Otherwise, it's going to be say I don't know fifty years from now, the number of loan words from English is going to grow I don't know tenfold, a hundredfold, and that's just unfortunate. Hmm. So what do you hold as, I mean, you, part of your start of your answer, it felt like that was an educational issue, just the way you're taught. But yes. I'm sort of wondering now, though, you've sort of ended more on gatekeeping, questions around gatekeeping, because oh. it's... No, it felt I, like I, didn't that mean that in, I don't mean that in gatekeeping. Okay. 
I don't mean uh, you're saying it should be gatekeeping. I mean, the reason it's so slow is because there is some kind of gatekeeping around the language. I, I don't think it's gatekeeping and I don't think it's on purpose. I think it's that, let's say, there's a new technology comes across, right? So our, no, artificial intelligence, I mean, we, we have that. I'm trying to find uh, like new words, let's say, that come out, you know? It's kind of like, who is the body responsible or is there a body responsible to one create an arabic word for it because sometimes we have to create a word and we don't have to create it from blank like arabic is a root language that means there's always these three root three letter roots that we can do right but who does that and when do we do that and how do we popularize the word enough that people will adopt it to speak it that would be something that would be relegated to the scientific journals where most of the people would not see it. Is there something on TV or on radio mentioning these words over and over again so that, you know, so that the language feels more current, natively current, and not have so many loan words that it might become unrecognizable if I'm talking, you know, something on a scientific pro project or Okay, Let, let's forget science and technology for a bit. I work in tax transparency laws. That's my day job, right? I have to do presentations all over, including the Arab world. It is, and I like to keep my words, like if I'm talking Arabic, I want to talk just Arabic, right? But sometimes it's kind of like, how do I talk about concepts of the finance world that just people don't use? So because people don't don't know them. So I have to use a lot of English and that bothers me. Hmm. I, I I didn't mean it to sound very negative. My no, answer, no, no, I don't think I, okay. I don't think it comes across as negative. It's just obviously as you're saying, I'm wondering, is this a question of people who sort of decide on language being too conservative with how it should be done? Or is it just the opposite? It's the fact that there's not enough social investment yes. in these things. Yes, I think there's not enough. But but again, I'm not saying like this is a conscious decision. Maybe because, I don't know, it's not a subject that people care enough about because they have other cares in the world, mm. you know? So I now want to change pace a little bit because obviously yes, you please. do a lot of uh, research uh, you never seen a man more glad for a change in subject uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so because obviously you do a lot of these deep dives into like words and I'm sort of wondering about your research process how do you sort of trace the origins of words and what's your research do you use uh, yeah so as as all kind of like my first start uh, is you know Google and Wikipedia believe it or not. And I know people are like, ah, oh, Wikipedia is, it's like, yeah, Wikipedia is not a good source for the, like the veracity or the authenticity, but it's great as a first, uh, say, first stage, because then you could source your, um, the resources and trying to find first resources just to find things. But I also want to say that I do have a couple of etymology dictionaries. It's kind of like the source of words, but my main source is Google Books, to be honest. Google Books is just kind of like a repository of books. A lot of them are free and a lot of them are old. So I have dictionaries, English dictionaries from the 17th century and the 18th century. So, and these are available for everyone and they're free. And and same thing for the um, web archive. It's a website that also have a lot of internet archive and stuff like that, right? Uh, my third source is JSTOR, which is a portal where there's a lot of academic papers, uh, especially on linguistics. And for people who are interested in that, during the pandemic, uh, JSTOR, uh, because uh, it's a paid portal, but JSTOR changed their uh, policy during the pandemic, and it has not changed yet, where you can read 100 academic paper a month without having to pay anything. So for people interested in that subject, I highly recommend going there. I mean, I've learned so much from having to do this research. So on that, just a small note in that in 99.9% .9 of the videos I do, it's never that I have the information. It's never that I know it. 
is that I'm looking into it because I'm interested. And the video is a way of saying, by the way, look what I learned, that kind of thing. So I suppose this leads to the question of um, when do you get to the point where you're like, OK, I feel like I have enough here to actually do a video, because, of course, treading words, you can find all you can go on for a long time. You know, there's obviously a lot we don't know about where words arise from, because I think part of the issue it's the same issue with history generally like if you're looking for let's say who was the first to ever have hummus for example oh my well, that's god not, you're not <laughs> going to find you know what you might find is we have the oldest surviving manual from this area yeah right but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, that's the area it originated from it could be that this was in wide circulation this person wrote about it it yeah. could be that the other manuals from other areas didn't survive there's all sorts 100%. of things so how does you how does that work for languages when you sort of how do you get to a point where you decide, OK, I've got enough now to go on? Uh, saying kind of like way I have what I have, um, how I have it, if I have enough or not, is rarely based on the research, but it's partially on the research. It, to me, it's kind of like uh, this is well, like my videos are not linguistics. They are pop linguistics. Right. So it's about how am I able to dissect this subject into a 90 second video that could make it relatable because I could do a video where I'm listing all the academic resources and stuff like that. And people might get bored. I'm not writing a thesis. I'm just trying to find a way to relate a story in a way that might make people more interested on the subject. And if they want to research it more, they can do it themselves. So for me, it's, less about doing enough research although, although that's the basics but about do i understand it enough in a way that i can put it in a story of a 90 second video that people might um, might like if i have that then i can do the video and there are cases where i've said uh there is no answer or i wasn't able to find an answer so it I, that's not an issue for me so so in your sort of, because obviously a lot of it are deep dives into language, I'm wondering, so from all the deep dives you've done, what has surprised you the most? And what was the most sort of case you thought was among the most interesting? Uh, it was my initial one, my initial uh, research into the word orange that I mentioned earlier. To me, because that was an early one, that was just kind of like, oh my God, that's so surprising. In that a word orange gave me the research gave me the tool to look up to understand so much history about other populations and the trade routes back in the time in that if i'm going to summarize it real quick in that you know the word orange that's used in english french i mean the root of it uh italian spanish etc came because it was a word that was given to them by uh arabs through who were given to it from the Persians and it came from India, right? And it's kind of like trying to understand because the trade route went that way and it was the bitter orange. But for them, they kept the name orange for bitter and sweet oranges. Whereas for us in the Arabic world, we kept the name uh, related to orange, which is not orange for bitter oranges. However, because we got the sweet oranges from the Portuguese, the name of the fruit in Arabic is Portugal, which is the same as Portugal or Portugal. It might sound obvious now, but it's kind of like, oh, my God, you learn so much about the history. And then you understand it's like, oh, but the Portuguese got it from Chinese, which is why the name for the sweet orange is Quitrus Sinensis, which means the Chinese citrus. So that kind of like trying to imagine how it was back then and how people trade and decided on the names. So that was the surprising part for me. It's kind of like how one word would make you so much more interested in the history of ancient civilizations or people and stuff like that. It's it's always interesting, especially with food, because, you know, yes. I mean, yes. like for example, you've got the obvious example of the bird turkey. Why is it called yeah. a turkey? <laughs> well, even though it doesn't come from Turkey originally, it's yes. originally part of the Colombian exchange. So it comes from Colombia, ends up in Turkey, comes to European ports, then it gets Absolutely. called Turkey. I think yeah. the best I think the best one I learned uh, reading around was there's a relationship in Latin, um, which is through medieval Christendom about between, say, the word for apple and the word for evil. Yes. 
<laughs> uh, yes. Uh, but that that's kind of like a, how to say, it's a homonym. It's not the same word. As in, uh, the word for apple, uh, what malum, right? And the word for evil, the way it's kind of like the tree of uh, good and evil, it's malum, like the lo the longer a, and that was uh, because it's a homonym, and it's it's thought to be how to say a uh, pun, like it's a purposeful selection, like in the biblical recitation of Adam and Eve and all that. So there's no mention of the apple. Is that people thought of it as the apple because when Saint Jerome was writing the Bible in Latin and the Vulgate is calling evil malum malum, and then people started thinking of it as an apple. But yeah, like in the Quran, it's not mentioned, in the Bible, it's not mentioned. It's just through a uh, homonym that people started thinking of it as an apple. Yeah, and I think there's a few from Latin like that. I think there's also the relationship between meat eating, so carnival related from that word and the word carn uh the word for sort of lust which is carn carn uh, Ooh, interesting. cardinal interesting. Like, there might have been a relationship there like if you eat too much meat you might be tempted to sin in other fleshy ways Ooh, very interesting so, so know about the, that one <laughs> so the video will probably find a lot like that but i think of all your videos the one that sort of interested me the most was the one you did on the origins of the word for austria in arabic which is that uh, nimsa. Yeah. Nimsa. Uh, Nimsa, and it's really interesting to my mind because it's like, um, you know, you sort of wonder where do these names for countries come from, right? Yes. And there's all there's always some kind of interaction, but it's interesting because I think, as you point out in the video, it's obviously originally it comes via Turkish, which mm. themselves they get it from, you know, various Eastern European languages, a Slavic word. Uh, and in Slavic, I was listening to a lecture by uh, Timothy Schneider. He was talking about, he had this one bit where he was talking about the word for Germany in Slavic languages, mm -hmm. uh, which is related to this word, El Nimsa. And to them, it meant, you know, the muted ones, the yep. ones unable to. And what he was saying is what this sort of suggests to you is that there's a kind of linguistic civilizational barrier between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And for Eastern Europeans, it was the German speaking countries. That was the barrier. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then the Arabs have imported this word from the Turks because the yeah. Turks are in that area. And I mean, and what's interesting there is that uh, this is a feature that was not just had thought of by the Eastern European. It's kind of like when you say the mute ones, right? So we did that. We did that as in the Arabs did that because Originally, the word ajam meant the mute ones, but then it evolved into being like the people who are making sounds that are unintelligible, right? And then we use that word ajam to talk about any non-Arabic speaking world uh, people, right? Uh, even though in modern times it is used for some of the Persian folks, but in Andalusian times it meant people in there who do not speak Arabic. And, you know, like the famous one, also the Greeks, like any, well, who's the barbarian? It's the people who do not speak Greek because their sound is bar, 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 now that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was going to bring up the Greeks because that is, yeah. something. but I think it's interesting because in Rome, it becomes an official term used for non Roman yes. citizens. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's something that you see sort of transform through the ages. Yeah. Uh, yeah i think there's i mean there's a lot you can do with languages it just yeah. unveils so much i mean we've sort of hinted at different things you could look at but it's it's a very big area yeah. uh, and so i'm sort of just also sort of wondering because uh, obviously we've mentioned a bit about uh, the interaction you have with the audience but i also yeah. wonder have linguists themselves been like in touch with you about things Let's see th that's a uh, how to say i have a bit of a what do you call it? imposter syndrome right because i'm not a, i'm not a linguist and i never claim to be a linguist it's kind of like i'm just trying to find that way so in my mind there's always in the back of my head it's kind of like if people read uh, watch the video and like it awesome but what would linguists think like would they look upon that as kind of like ah uh, you know like you don't know what you're talking about so far that has not happened except in a few situations where they would correct me on things and i'm obviously open to corrections but i'm happy that so I'm I'm friends with linguists now because of that. So I've been contacted by them. 
and they would give me pointers and I, I just love it, you know? So as long as I don't make a big fool out of myself, I mean, and if I do that, I will take down the video, but it's like, as long as they give me a little bit, it's like, okay, it's, it's good so far. I, I'm happy. So again, it's kind of like, I'm not claiming to discovering anything in linguistics, just making it accessible to some people who might enjoy it the way I am. I feel like that's how it should be with professionals like that, because what you really want to do is encourage a spirit of inquiry among yeah. various people. And there are obviously people who sort of really do believe in that. And there are others who are like, no, we don't believe in that. So yeah. <laughs> I think it seems like you're fortunate enough to get the sort of right people involved. Um, thankfully. And uh, thankfully, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was also just as you were talking, I was thinking of another word. Because <laughs> we can go on forever like this. Like I was thinking about the relationship, possible relationship between the sort of b- biblical belief in succubies. Um, so you probably are familiar with the story of Lilith or Lilut. Um, and the word for lullaby, which you sing to children, which oh. apparently there might be a relationship because it originally would have been uh, lily avi, which means Lilith go away or something akin to that. Okay. And it becomes lullaby because you sing it to children to frighten away the... Oh, wow. <laughs> I did not know about that one. Okay, that's... Okay, you're you're setting me off on a, a couple of days of research now. <laughs> I, I could be completely wrong. I saw it on the History yeah. Channel once. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't don't take my word at it. I know it's gonna go to the podcast, it doesn't matter. I'm not I'm not the one doing videos <laughs> on linguistics. Um but, but yeah. if I if I mention something here, it's kind of like because I, I did a video about nightmares, right? So yeah. the words for nightmares in different languages always uh, well, many of them involve something pressing on your chest, right? So whether it's the incubus in Latin and um, you know, koshmar in French or kabus or jathum in Arabic, you know. But because you mentioned Latin, it was, it's very interesting. So uh, incubus, it's I might have the, these flip, but incubus is the one sitting on top of you because pressing on your chest. But the succubus, it was the uh, image of a woman because this is where the bit of like how gender plays. It's the one that is under you because it's sub. And to me, it's kind of like, I don't think other languages differentiated between like night demons, incubus and succubus based on whether they're on top of you or they're below you. So this is kind of interesting. The demonology is an entire topic we need, uh, I need someone to go into at some point. It's just really fascinating yeah. stuff because <laughs> you get so much from it as well. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I, uh, I would like to sort of sort of bring this to a close and sort of ask you the last question, which is uh, about what the future holds in store for you and your channel. Uh, I, I honestly do not have a you know, concrete answer to that. So I'm for now, I'm very much enjoying de- doing these videos and I will continue to do so. But as, as I say, it's like I do have a day job. So and uh, I don't have my channel monetized or anything like that. And I don't think I plan to do it anytime soon because I don't know how. But, you know, so the idea is that I'm just doing it for fun. I'm not continuing doing it for fun. But if the future contains positive things, awesome. And I'm hoping it will. So I think probably you've got uh, your lullaby video. We got to look forward to by the sounds of it now. It'll take me. A, it'll take me some time. <laughs> but actually, just before you before you run, it'd be good to get yeah. your comment on this. There is actually a lot of interest in because if I look at YouTube, there's now like an entire community of YouTubers who are dedicated to learning so-called dead languages. You know, there's one guy who's like almost completely fluent in restored classical Latin. Oh, well, wow. Actually, completely fluent now. Okay. Uh, and he also does it for Attic Greek as well. He does his entire YouTube channel in like Latin and Greek. Wow. So uh, there, there does seem to be like a real hunger for this sort of stuff, wouldn't you? From your, and I'm getting the same vibe from you that there is a real hunger for this sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I see that too. I see that too. But now that you mentioned languages, I do like, I mean, that'd be a nice thing to be able to learn a dead language. But <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe some, some other time. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, apparently there's 20,000 speakers of restored classical Latin now. Wow. I wonder if they look down upon speakers of vulgar Latin. <laughs> vulgar or even ecclesiastical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my God. The, the debate on the pronunciation of Latin bit, classical versus ecclesiastical, that just is kind of like, guys, like, wh- why are we having fights on this? 
It's 2023. <laughs> it's worth having a fight. You know, if there's something to fight about, it's always good. <laughs> Uh, thank you for talking to us at Middle East Monitor. Thank you very much for having me. Thank and you. to our audience, thank you for tuning in. Please do tune in next time for more Memo Conversations. And if you've missed any others, please go to our website for more.